Joining me now is Horford McKinder, Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford, who, together with Sally Tomlinson, has just written Rule Britannia, Brexit and the End of Empire. Thanks so much, Danny, for coming back on. So what's the book about, given it has a kind of remain vision, arguably, and we have that vote tomorrow, which, without Gina Miller, who's been on this show, maybe we wouldn't have had. She'd probably like this book, wouldn't she? It's all pretty pro-Remain. Uh, you could see it as pro-Remain. Me and Sally are both, you know, Oxford-based... Uh, academics <laughs> in one of the citadels of Remain. But what we try and do in a book is step back and back and back from this. Um, and we do try to, try to cover the other side, mainly the pro-Tory argument for Brexit. But we're fundamentally trying to answer the question of why has this happened? Why was Britain the first country after Greenland to try to leave the EU? When you run a slogan called Take Back Control, it's how important is the back bit. There was a time, not very long ago, where this country had more control of more people than any other country has ever had in the history of humankind. You know, we really did have control. And I think part of the reason that that slogan works is there's a sense that when we were in control, things were going well and getting better. So in a sense, if we leave Lexit to side, the yeah. left-wing case for it, so this book basically explains why the right, who one would expect to support neoliberalism, the City of London and so on, why on earth they should be opposing what the Lexa GSA is a neoliberal institution? Well, some of them, I mean, some of the right are very for the European Union because they understand that the City of London absolutely depends on being in the European Union. Others on the right see a, a larger financial picture. I mean, Rees Mogg's father wrote a book saying that the world will be a kind of pirate world in future and you really do want to be a treasure island offset from it. But when you look at the leading Brexiteers, so many of them grew up in former colonies. So many grew up in families which, who had servants. Which ones? Um, go through, I, don't, I want to be careful over <laughs> ascribing their particular views to their childhood. Sure. Um, and remember, a lot of them were very rich. Uh, so we had to be very careful writing this book um, because, yeah. you know, they get litigious. But we do list uh, in the book uh, a series of names of ones who grew up somewhere else in affluence and their families have gone, and this includes the families of, of leading Remainers. David Cameron's family were at the top of the world a few generations ago and you know what's David doing now is he got out of his shed you know you get a feeling of being diminished in Britain if you were in the top one or two percent in Britain your grandfather and your great-grandfather was deciding whether he wanted to run India or do something else big in London uh, and you you're trying to get a job with a stockbroker well I want to get on to some of that Commonwealth uh, colony stuff and in a second Ironic, though, that tomorrow's vote seems to centre on England's oldest colony, Ireland. Yes. You say in uh, the book, you claim almost no whiff of understanding of England's first colony mm. uh, in 1169 was evident until 2017. What's yeah. the irony that tomorrow it'll all be the well, Irish border? It's incredible. I mean, nobody realised that that border was sacrosanct. Really? You can't... At the time of the, of the debate... No, the, the assumption was Ireland hardly matters. There were a few country roads crossing a border. That's not... A, and then, oh, we can have technological solutions. You remember all of that? I mean, thank God it's gone quiet. But the idea we're going to use some kind of supercomputer, I mean, you don't have to have a hard border, and drones, presumably. It, there's a real irony in that the first colony of England and a country which the English treated, in some ways, almost more despicably than anywhere else in the world, uh, the, uh, the, to our Indian viewers, of course, will be closely contested. They will contest that. it, but almost one of the few places in the world that has a lower population now than it had 160, 170 years ago, which is quite incredible. That, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a sort of justice that it's Ireland, um, I, I think, that is, is the key sticking point in this. And Ireland, if Britain does leave, becomes the only English speaking country in, significant country in the Union. It's the place you want to set up your business if the people you want to hire from England want their children to speak English. But going back to the Empire thesis in the book, yes. so it's natural that immigration and falsified narratives of immigration would play 
a yeah. starring role in the whole Brexit debate then? Yeah, I mean... Freedom oh, of movement. Well, of other countries in Europe, is, is, uh, one, the question the book comes to ask is, what's different about this country that meant we did it significantly first? We have had higher rates of immigration for a much longer period than much of the mainland. And one result of that is very multicultural society. London is the real big apple of the world. But we've also had a legacy since at least 1901, we have cartoons from 1901, of incredible racist propaganda against each immigrant group associated with fascism. And that same uh, propaganda was rolled out for, ironically, extremely white, very pale white Eastern Europeans. Why was the fear of immigration stoked up and up and up in this country? The fear being strongest in the areas, areas with the least immigrants. It was partly stoked up because it, this was a natural trope that the British have run for longer than other people, uh, but also because the newspapers and the propagandists don't want to talk about inequality. They want to tell you that you've got a problem with your schools and your houses and your hospitals and your wages because of the immigrants, not because the rich are taking a bigger and bigger slice of the pie. That poses a question as to why Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is also uh, keen to say freedom of movement is a very important issue here around the people's, yeah. uh, the vote uh, for Brexit. Oh, Labour... Why, why La is Labour saying that? Labour doesn't have a particularly clean record on immigration. It's just never been as nasty as the Tories, so we haven't uh, realised that. And why did the British have this problem? You know, Enoch Powell went out almost begging people to come here and work to keep the buses running and the health service running. And we have this problem, particularly in England, the Empire, the English Empire is so much bigger than the others, because we governed other people without their consent on the assumption that we were naturally racially superior to them, and it was in their interest, as, w as well as ours, that we should be in charge of them. From the Lexit point of view, one could say that this uniqueness that you keep pointing to in the yes. book could open a vision of a post-Brexit Britain that is equally as unique and that limits the power of the City of London and allows the renationalisation, perhaps without compensation, of housing, of water, of electricity, of energy and uh, of the railways. You could. And you don't address that so much. We don't because I can see how theoretically you could. If everybody agreed and we all work, work together to create this socialist utopia in a matter of, say, 15 years, working very hard, but we... Well, the Attlee government did quite a lot in but the Attlee, five or ten. The Attlee government did it after two generations of men had been forced to fight side by side in wars that could have been avoided. Uh, and that gets you the kind of attitude you need to get people to really, you know, we haven't mixed our population in the same way that they mixed when they were fighting a war. We've actually divided our population into segregated schools, more segregated than anywhere else in Europe. Much of the rest of Europe where people have decent regulation on their rents, uh, where you, places where homelessness are falling, the places where infant mortality is already half our rate and getting better. Okay, uh, I'll to, leave to one side whether to, the left to, in those different countries feels it is under attack and as, as uh, its own sellers. But as a yeah. as a professor at one of our elite uh, institutions, you do say in the book that uh, history teaching is another key, certainly to the next generation when it comes yeah. to decisions like this, uh, because you basically excoriate history teaching in the schools. History False narratives, in, English history teaching, and, and this isn't necessarily our fault. It is relatively easy. Teachers like you. <laughs> it's just like me, because if you are in Germany, the history you teach in Germany is a very realistic history about what happened in Europe because of losing a war. We didn't lose a war. We haven't lost a war for a very long time. We haven't had to correct the story we've told ourselves. Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but then we, when, we do, when we do lose a war, we pretend that we weren't really involved. Was it a war? Oh, that was the Americans, you know. We don't admit to our failings. We tell ourselves repeated lies about ourselves. I'm going to also ask that, I mean, obviously your chair is Horford McKinder. Uh, Maybe yes. people won't know that much about it. What, the tools that we're being given on television, or mainstream television, to understand why Britain is voting uh, was, in a sense, the Benedict Cumberbatch uh, starred, yeah. uh, starred in a film about Brexit. What did you make of this narrative that a lot of people are talking about, which mm. is... 
this is Facebook, maybe the Russians, yeah. maybe digital marketing. It's nothing to do... What, what does the social matter? geography offer us as a way of understanding the real reasons for this? Oh, I mean, you can, you can look... The, the, the thing we know more about the vote than anything else is the geography of it. We are absolutely sure how many people voted Leave and Remain in each area. And old people who don't go on Facebook. So the digital media marketing thing mattered a bit, but it wasn't as crucial as it's being made out to be. We have a lot in, about Dominic Cummings in the book because he is fascinating, and if you're trying to... Svengali figure credited with swinging it. Oh, but also part of a group of young conservatives who were dedicated to this kind of thing happening, and that's been forgotten. And then you look at his version of the history of England, what he writes when you look at his great big thesis about the greatness of this place and so on, and you can see that he thinks we've lost something. He thinks we need to take back control to get back to our rightful place that we should be. And you need to understand that to understand why this happened to us. Because we were a place where people like Dominic Cummings could win. Whereas countries like France and Germany and Spain and Italy are not places where people like Dominic Cummings can win. Conservatives can win. But not people who are trying to take you back, you know, a hundred years to an idea that they have in their head that they've read in their history books in their particular schools that they went to about a greatness that they think should come back again. Professor Danny Dorling, thank you. Thank you very much.